WHIP Radio in Philadelphia. We all know the news by now. Chip Kelly is out with the Philadelphia Eagles as his three-year run ends. Now joining us on the hotline is a man that was right on Chip Kelly all from the start, and that's NFL Network analyst and Super Bowl champion Heath Evans. Heath, welcome back to the Philly Airwaves, and how are you? I'm good, buddy. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for coming on, and you were adamant from the start that Chip Kelly wouldn't work in Philadelphia. Why was that? Well, I mean, I, I remember when the the news first started kind of circling about a lot of different NFL teams. I mean, I remember it was Cleveland, it was Philly, but there was a few others in the mix, too, that I don't remember from three years back who they were that they were interested in Chip. And so, you know, being an SEC guy and obviously being in uh, the NFL world, I don't get a lot of time to study college tape. And so... I went back and I remember watching 10, you know, Oregon games, big national championship games, um, some non-conference games, and then some conference games there out in, in the Pac-10, I think at the time, but before the Pac-12. And there was just this underlying issue of undisciplined play and, and what I would call um, poor scheme, like un- unblocked defenders, um, schemes that I knew ultimately wouldn't work for the long haul in the NFL. Um, anytime there's something new, it takes our league time to catch up to it. I mean, RG3's rookie year was one of the greatest quarterback rookie years ever, and yet um, once the league caught up to what he could and couldn't do, um, we now know the story of what's happened to RG3. And I just thought that with what I saw on tape um, from the Oregon experience, um, if that was all that it was, um, it was going to fail and fail miserably eventually in our league. This was such a quick fall from grace because, like you said, in the first year, he took the league by storm, uh, went to the playoffs. They lost to the Saints late at Lincoln Financial Field. And then after that, in the second year, they start out 9-3, and three, then don't make the playoffs. And this year was just a complete and utter disaster. When you see that year 2-3 and three, that ultimately cost them his job, what went wrong in years 2-3 and three with Chip Kelly? Well, and I see, and Zach, we've talked a bunch over the last couple of years. I think it was the same thing that went wrong in, in year one. You know, I mean, um, until he beat the Patriots, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was no marquee win. And and most people that know our game know what the, the Patriots were playing with offensively and defensively, and so they didn't really qualify it as a marquee win. That being said, Chip still went to Gillette in Foxborough and won a big game that his team needed to win. And so that was a... I thought it was a quality statement for uh, what his team had the potential to be, but the underlying glaring issues of red zone offense, red zone production, the fact that he was always just completely unwilling to back off his 60-minute tempo. And people always talk about the 60-minute tempo as, you know, it, it affects the defense, and we see the defense get tired. And people called me crazy, and I wasn't calling out Jason Peters. I was more defending his play last December when the big man was just exhausted. He's still probably the best left tackle in the game. I know he had back injuries and other stuff this year, but the truth is is you hurt your offense as much as you're hurting the defense with 60-minute tempo. And when you play the good, strong, mentally tough, disciplined teams, uh, that 60-minute tempo was always the glaring weakness of the team because his offense was making more mistakes than the defense versus the good teams. People always wanted to calculate 10 wins. Well, 10 wins for Andy Reid was a losing season, you know. Um, being knocked out in the first round of the playoffs with all the talent that Chip inherited, um, th- that wasn't – I was never all that impressed. And, and I don't think um, the 10 wins last year um, were all that impressive either. So I think the underlying – like what Chip's mindset, what his beliefs were, um, I, I don't think are ever going to change. And that's his prerogative. Um, but in our league – uh, everybody wants new and fresh, and people want to change. Well, if it's not broke, don't fix it. The Seattle Seahawks aren't a flashy offense, still to this point. The last two years, that they've been somewhat of a boring offense. They run the ball, they play great defense, and they play dominant special teams. And yet they've been in two Super Bowls. The New England Patriots a lot of times aren't fresh and flashy. They're tough. They're, they're, they're mentally disciplined. The Baltimore Ravens normally, when they're not beat to smithereens, um, you look at even the Green Bay Packer team in 2010 when they won their Super Bowl, the, the Niners under a hardball. Um, the, our game is not a difficult one. People want change, but why are we changing something that's, that's not broke? The tough, physical, uh, mentally disciplined teams are the ones that win. We don't need some flashy 60-minute tempo to try to fix up our game. And, and that's where I feel like Jeffrey Laurie just had bad people in his ear three years ago. And, and I, fear, I fear that he still has 
people that maybe somewhat this game has passed by, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to people that have been in this game much longer than me, um, but it's important that owners who are, you know, multi-billionaires, businessmen, have good, um, up-to-date, um, I guess, wise NFL guys in their ears because they're limited to what people are telling them. And, and the Chip Kelly hire, um, listen, I talked to some of the best coaches that have ever coached this game, and I build my thoughts about how they taught me when I played for them, and I build my thoughts about what I see on film. And um, for anybody with a trained eye, they should have known that that hire wasn't going to work unless Chip changed a lot of his belief system, which I never believed he would. And it was announced today that Jeffrey Lurie, Howie Roseman, and Tom Donahoe are going to lead the search in finding this next head coach. Everyone's going to speculate, but if you had to give us some names, who do you think are some replacements that will go in there and take over for Chip? I have absolutely no idea. I mean, I guess, um, you know, I listened to, to Jeffrey's comments today, and I think they were wise comments. I think the fact that you are looking in the college ranks, the fact that you're looking uh, for assistant OCs, DCs, even current head coaches. Um, you know, I think um, some of the rumors out there that, you know, Sean Payton is, is going to leave New Orleans. Um, I just I find that hard to believe. Um, him and Drew, I think, have a lot of good football left to play together. Um, you, I, I, I just, I don't know, um, Howie or Tom well enough to know what their thought processes are. I just know that they were thoroughly flawed when they hired Chip. And, and listen, I've made a lot of, you know, wrong reads and wrong mistakes in football games and everything else. But I think when you're hiring a football coach, um, there's certain things that are going to work in our league and, and what Chip put on tape, um, you know, in his three years as the head coach of Oregon, um, just clearly told me that this was this was never going to be a, a Lombardi hoisting coach, and that temperament of his teams um, were undisciplined in big moments, and and those characteristics from Oregon um, have been you know all over the tape for the last three years. We're spending a few minutes with Heath Evans from the NFL Network and won a Super Bowl championship Lombardi trophy with the New Orleans Saints. Chip had such a steadfast approach here in Philadelphia. He was very stubborn. It was his way or the highway, and that came at the expense of losing many great players for virtually nothing. Lane Johnson came out. I just saw this tweet on uh, Twitter from Albert Breer that a lot of players didn't feel comfortable going to Chip, and they would talk to their position coaches. Why do you think that was? I don't know. I hate to speculate. You know, Zach, you've known me long enough to know I look at Tate and I judge what I see. I don't, you know, Chip the man, I'm sure, is a good man. And I'm sure he probably loved those guys the best that he could. I'm sure he had the best intentions for Mr. Lurie and the Eagles fan base and the team um, at the forefront of his mind. Um, personalities are different. You know, I mean, Chip's a, you know, he's a, he's a different personality. He's a think tank type guy. You know, he's a science guy that has brought science into a lot of the recovery mechanisms that, um, you know, personally with a lot of the players that I've talked with, they don't agree with his science. And I think the performance of his team um, late in the year, the last two years would tell you that his science is wrong and that this team is fatigued and the practice habits and uh, when you rest your players and when you work your players, um, you're not dealing with, you know, 21 and 22 year olds anymore. You're dealing with 28, 34 year olds that need, um, a rest and recovery mechanism that's obviously been put in place by our NFL for years, and it works for the great team. So why switch it up? I don't know. I think we don't change things just to change things. But um, when players see guys like D-Jack and, and Shady shipped off, and for Zach, what you mentioned for you know next to nothing, we can spend the dollars and cents of, oh, we gave Shady up and we got three players in return. You still played DeMarco $8 million this year. Um, and, and so you spend the numbers however you want. You weren't saving a penny. Um, you might have been pushing it further down the tracks in the cap sense, but you were. You still swapped out a, you know, one of the best running backs that's played in our game for the last five years for DeMarco, who just didn't fit um, what Chip was wanting to do. And I was screaming and telling people that last year when the signing happened in, in March. Um, but um, the – that fear factor of man, he shipped out D Jack and Shady. Then you know how approachable is he? That that makes sense to me. But again, I want to clarify: I don't know, and I don't know Chip, and I know a bunch of players on the team uh, that I've spoken to, and I know their personalities. But um, you know, to me, a coach has to create an open door policy, and a coach has to create um, a relationship where his players feel safe 
um, coming and communicating, but also knowing that, hey, just because you get to communicate your thoughts as a player, um, Bill Belichick and Sean Payton and Mike Holmgren, the great coaches that I played for, um, doesn't mean they're going to accept your comments or your feelings, but the ability to communicate with your head coach, especially as a veteran player after you've earned their trust, I think is a valuable thing that's really a, a must-have on championship-type teams. Just being in the NFL for so long and being in these locker rooms, you know how important the offensive line position is. And I remember you saying on the NFL Network when Chip was hired that he better bring in an experienced offensive line coach. How would you grade the performance of Chip Kelly in handling the offensive line? And just take us in really how important bringing in an experienced offensive line coach is. Yeah, well, I mean, it was the guy from Alabama that he brought in, and I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. Um, Stalin. You know, the thing, yeah, the thing about offensive line play in our business is it's everything. I mean, there was we've seen the Patriots this year with, I mean, some games four backups on their offensive line beat quality teams. I mean, they played the Jets, um, you know, this last week and lost in overtime with three plus backups. No, neither of your starting tackles. You know, across the line, it's one of the best defenses in the league, and you know they pretty much held their own. You know, and then you don't even go into the lack of offensive talent that they lost at the wide receiver position that they were playing with, and yet they still almost beat them. And so, um, great teaching at that position can overcome so many other deficits. And what I learned in New England in my four years about, hey, listen, we might not go into a game plan with you know, eight, nine runs, but the four runs we have, we're going to be able to block and adjust versus anything that defense does. And then our pass protection, um, we're going to have an answer for anything they can possibly do. And if, if you have a teacher in that offensive line room, and I think it starts with the head coach empowering that offensive line coach um, to, to be a strong voice for that staff, you can overcome pretty much anything in this league. And, and that's what's necessary in the talent. You know, people all year have said, you know, different things about that offensive line. I'm like, the coaches that I played for would have died to have Kelsey at center and Lane at right tackle and Jason and then have to deal with two inexperienced guards. I mean, I always go back to the Patriots, but you look at, you know, they lose Stolter week one, so they take your right tackle, Volmer, and put them over at left. You're mismatching guards, uh, undrafted rookie free agents in there at guard and center, and yet... This team's sitting at, at 12 wins, you know, probably get ready to get 13 in week 17 in Miami. Um, so great teaching at that offensive line position. It's, it's honestly the most important hire uh, at the professional level. Heath, you take a look at the power play going back to Chip Kelly when he went for that title of GM and head coach. Howie Roseman, I thought he played it perfectly. He remained quiet. He got a raise, moved to the other side of the office, and still remained a close confidant of uh, owner in Jeffrey Laurie, and now he's back in power. And the Eagles keep on wavering back and forth with this power struggle of GM and head coach. Do you think Jeffrey Laurie even knows what he wants, big picture? Um, well, it worked with Andy Reid, you know, and, and I think – um, and again, I don't, I don't know how we, I just, I judge people on their hires and, and their decision making ability. Listen, no one's perfect in this business and how he's a smart man. And he's been at it a lot longer than me. So I never mean any disrespect at all. I just, you know, the, the Chip Kelly hire for anyone that, um, backed it, I, I, I wonder what they saw and, and why they thought it would work if they really know our game. And so I think if, if I was going to be a head coach in this league, I would want what Chip was asking for. But I, I think Chip knew what came with that. And, and how he said it, or not how he, but uh, uh, Mr. Laurie said it this morning in his, in his press conference that you know, with that responsibility, at least you know where to, to place the blame or to give credit. And so um, the, the special balance of powers between a, a head coach um, being able to really control his roster um, and get the players that he believes will fit his system, I think is huge. And we've seen great coaches um, – stripped of their ability to really coach and perform um, the way that they were capable of because they didn't have executive power to bring in the players that they want. And so I'm all for giving Chip the power that he got. It it was just slightly mismanaged and it didn't work out in his favor. Um, But if I'm an owner, um, I I think I want a coach that wants all full responsibility so that all the blame – um, can be on his shoulders if it doesn't work. When you have a GM making personnel decisions and a coach trying to coach the players that that GM felt were best for whatever reason, who, who do you who do you blame? I mean, I look at Wes Welker in Miami. 
I don't want to say he was a nobody, but Bill Belichick saw something in him that said, hey, this guy can be the best slot receiver that can ever play the game. And yet they got him on the cheap from Miami, and then the world finds out who Wes Welker is. Well, you know, Bill got credit for that decision, and Scott Pioli as well. Um, but it's so hard to judge what's working and what's not and who's responsible when you have two different heads of powers trying to accomplish the same thing. So um, I, I always go back to the humility factor between Bill Belichick and Scott Pioli. Um, how they balanced each other out, how they never moved when they both weren't in agreement. Um, but it started with this humble nature of, hey, listen, we're going to put our minds together, our football minds, and then we're going to put our pride to the side and say, what's best for Mr. Kraft and the Patriots? And that formula uh, worked for a long time. And now Floyd Reese is doing the same thing with Bill. And um, it, it always starts with, hey, what's best for the team and what's our core philosophy and what are we going after? Before we let you run, Heath, just because you mentioned Belichick so much in this interview, you know he wasn't a Hall of Fame coach uh, with the Browns, and uh, in New England now he's one of the better coaches that we've ever seen in this league. So with Chip Kelly, things didn't work out in Philadelphia. If this experience humbles him and he starts to adapt, do you think he could work in the NFL? Well, Zach, I know you're a bit younger than me, and people always bring this up, but the history of the Cleveland Browns built three years, or years there speak very clearly about how great of a coach he was back then. And you look at the staff he assembled and then where that staff is now and then just the power of the staff and the national championships and other Super Bowls that have been won from the staff that were with him in Cleveland. And then you look at year one, they were garbage. Year two, they were better. Uh, year three, um, you know, they were just, you know, absolutely killing it. Um, and then, you know, the team gets stripped out from underneath them midseason and the year falls apart. And so every year – it was kind of the exact opposite of Chip. Every year in Cleveland, he took a dumpster fire and got him better, better, and better. The owner, you know, decides to, you know, move the team to Baltimore. The team kind of falls apart internally, which any head coach, any player that's ever played in our league, if you had to go through that, um, I don't want to say there was no way around it, but that's exactly what happened. So where Chip kind of came in, took the league, took the good to average teams by storm, won 10 games, but still had some major flaws in red zone, third down, really in his coaching strategy and his performance strategy. And then year two, red zone, offense, everything got worse than it was the year before. And then year three, um, things really fell off the map. That's the exact opposite for, for Bill. You mentioned the word if he humbles himself. Yeah, I think Chip, if he gets off the 60-minute tempo, if he gets off um, the, the fact that, um, that there's got to be – X's and O's in the red zone, X's and O's on third down. It's not just about players going out and, and performing whatever play you call. There's a mental discipline to the great coaches that design and win in the red zone and third down football every single week. And those numbers, um, and, and back to the offensive line, the protection schemes um, and what you're calling based on what that defense is going to be running against you are huge. And, and Chip in three years only went backwards. And so I would say that was the exact opposite of what Belichick uh, did in Cleveland. Um, so we'll see. Um, I think there's some coaches that are just better at the college level. Uh, if I was Chip, I'd go back to the college level and focus on trying to dominate that level like Pete Carroll did before he would think about coming back to this level. Because this, um, this business, um, <laughs> it ain't for the faint of heart. And there's uh, thorough flaws in his coaching style as well as his fundamental belief of what works and what wins ball games. you got to remember, you know, he never fully climbed the mountain at the college ranks. Um, and, and it's some people could say that's a poor argument. Well, this is the big man's league. That's the little man's league. And so if you can't conquer the little man's league, I'm not sure would ever told anybody he'd be able to conquer our league. Heath, you're the best. We always appreciate you coming on with us and giving your insight. Thanks so much. All right, buddy. See you soon.